Good morning, everyone. Back into Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. And we'll just pick up with a little bit of context where we left off last week. Last week, we spent most, if not all, of our time on verses 16 through 30. Just to recap those, it's good to spend that much time on that section because this is programmatic, representative of Jesus' entire work and ministry. He's preaching in the, uh, on the Sabbath day, and he takes the scroll of Isaiah, and he proclaims that text, and then he says, it is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, I am he of whom this text speaks. So, just as we saw Jesus, when tempted by the devil, speak the word of Scripture, and that is our model as well. So here in his preaching, we see him not just fly off the cuff, but preach Scripture, the Old Testament Scripture. And an important thing, a simple thing, but easy to overlook, is that if this, if this text speaks of him, then all who heard that text in the original Old Testament context... Uh, so for Isaiah, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um, they are having faith in the one who is to come who will do these very things, you see. So Jesus isn't reinterpreting the text. Jesus is simply saying what the text means. And he's saying it's fulfilled now in me. So for all those hundreds of years prior to Jesus, the Old Testament faith was looking to the one who would do these things. Right? In other words, it was a messianic faith. The Old Testament faith is a Christian faith. It just doesn't know who the Christ is, who the Messiah is. Then Jesus comes and says, it is I. This text is fulfilled in your presence. Indeed, all the Old Testament texts are fulfilled in your presence if I am there. You see, now we have the reversal motif here, of course, and we talked about that very briefly. He is going to preach good news to the poor. He is going to preach liberty to the captives, uh, sight to the blind, liberty to those oppressed. And he's going to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which is the reversal of the way things are at present, such that slaves are released, debts are forgiven, um, and there's no labor to be done during that year. It's a year of, to live in God's grace and mercy and his provision. Okay, so this is what Jesus has come to do. And remember, I shared with you then that, uh, that painting by Matthias Grunewald of Christ. And he has Christ on the cross and he has Christ looking diseased and cursed and afflicted. And you see, if Christ is going to come what I, and do what Isaiah says, he is going to come and reverse the curse. <laughs> In order to reverse the curse for us who deserve it, he must take that curse upon himself, okay? And so he has to take on and become not only our sin, but take on and become our curse. And in so doing, he can set us free from the curse and free from sin. All right, and then everything's going swimmingly. The people are think this sermon is just marvelous. It was short, so of course they like it. And then Jesus decides to ruin their day, doesn't he? Yeah. I mean, it was a blessed and fantastic potluck right up until that moment uh, when Jesus decides to show them that the Jesus they're celebrating isn't who he is. The Jesus they think he is. The Jesus that they think, well, this is what he's come to do, make our lives easier, is not at all what he has come to do, not at all what he is. Okay? It's much deeper than that. And so he speaks of God's grace, uh, not to Jewish people, but points out two rather scandalous texts, again in the Old Testament, see how he's using the scriptures, that of Elijah with the widow of Zarephath. Okay? And Jesus' whole point is there's many, there were many Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, widows. God had mercy on this one Gentile. And then the next example with Elisha and the Syrian commander Naaman. There were many Jewish folks who had leprosy, and God chose to have mercy on this one Gentile leper named Naaman. And programmatic and important here too is, look, 
The miracle with Elijah is a miraculous feeding, right? The food doesn't run out. And it saves not only the life of Elijah, but also the widow. And, and remember, he raises her son. But look, a miraculous eating. And then in the next example, Elisha, uh, with, the, with name in the Syrian, remember, he's to wash himself seven times in the Jordan. And he does, and he comes out the seventh time, and he's clean. It's a miraculous washing, a washing away of leprosy. So programmatic for Jesus is not only the preaching of the cross, the preaching of his suffering, the preach of his becoming a curse for us, the preach of his therefore, the preaching of his therefore setting us all free from the curse, but then also he is going to come like Elijah with a miraculous food, and he is going to come like Elisha with a miraculous washing. And the people despise this. And they drive him to the brow of the hill to cast him off, a foreshadowing of the cross. And we too can see in our own way how the scandal of the cross has been transferred or is at least fluid with preaching, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. If you want Christians to be upset with you, preach what the text actually says. If you want Christians to be upset with you, say baptism does what the Bible says it does. If you want Christians to be upset with you, say communion is what Jesus says it is. You see, the same scandal that was, that was all the scandal of the cross has now been transferred to the ways in which the cross comes to us. Preaching, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. That's why these are the great scandals Uh, for the entire history of the church. Okay, that takes us up then uh, to the point at which Jesus passes through their midst, um, ironically giving them the very miracle that they were seeking, and yet uh, also revealing once again that he is true God in human flesh. Okay, and then on to the new material, unless there are any questions or comments remaining. Off we go. Verse 31. And Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. Now, we've heard that before, haven't we? Go back to chapter 4, verse 6. And the devil said to Jesus, To you I will give all this Authority. Did the devil ever have it to give? No. In the same way he promised Adam and Eve the knowledge of good and evil, could he actually give them the knowledge of good whatsoever? No, they already have it. What was he going to give us? The knowledge of evil, period. Thanks a lot. Okay. And same with Jesus. Uh, look, I'm going to give you all their authority and glory. And if Jesus would have bit and said, oh yeah, okay, great, I'll take it, there would have been none to give. Jesus possesses it himself, and that's Luke's point right here in this very same chapter, is that as he teaches, his word possesses authority, all right? In other words, he speaks, and it is so. Okay, verse uh, 33, and in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? What time does the demon think it is? The demon thinks it's the end of time. Have you come to destroy us? Is this it, right? Am I to be cast into the lake of fire now with Satan, my buddy? Right? With upper management. (laughs) right that's what he thinks now insightful because what the devils actually say what the demons the unclean spirits have to say is actually true all right and and they get things more deeply than jesus contemporary hearers get things and often more deeply obviously than you and i do but here's the thing they understand that in the incarnation of jesus the end is already at hand To go back to Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. And that's the problem, right? You're locked in. There's no help for this world. There's no rescue for this world. 
then God becomes man. Well, that's something new. And he says, behold, I have come to make all things new. And that's that bit, remember, about the baptism and the water and the Trinity and going back to Genesis 1. And that's the bit about the genealogy. And now there is a new Adam and a new line in Christ, a new creation of mankind, indeed a new human race in Christ. And this race conquers the devil. All right. And this race is faithful to the scriptures. And now it is uh, this race in Christ who has come. It is all to be made new. It is the apocalypse now. And the devil knows it. Now we don't. Ha! When's the end times, Pastor Rody? I don't know. Well, haven't you calculated from the book of Revelation uh, where exactly we are in the timeline? Bah. What does the book of Hebrews say right at the beginning? Now in these last days, well, clearly that was an error, huh? Shoot. Yes, he missed. And what about Jesus saying this generation wouldn't pass away before these things are fulfilled? And what about Paul saying, some of us will be changed in the twinkling of an eye? I guess Paul and Jesus and the author of Hebrews and everyone else, they were wrong about that, weren't they? How disappointing. Just, uh, they thought it was going to be that first century, and wow, well, it's gone 2,000 years, hasn't it? Idiotic. We don't even understand what the devils understand. That when Christ comes incarnate, that is the end. We are in the last times, now in these last days. We are in the last day proper. If you get into the seventh and eighth day theology, which I think we touched on a little earlier, when we were talking about baptism and circumcision, okay, this is it. And one thing that's very helpful to understand, it's just a simple idea, but it can open a lot of scripture, open up a lot of scriptures and have you understand them the way they're intended. When you look at the, the prophets of the Old Testament, major and minor, they're pointing to the coming of Christ as if it is the apocalyptic event. It is. His first coming and his second coming are really the same apocalyptic event. They're just two sides of the very same coin. That's the beginning and the end. Okay? And so when Jesus comes, it is indeed the last times, and the devil and his uh, unclean demons are freaking out. Have you come to destroy us? All right. Continuing with verse 34, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him. Now this is important. It doesn't just say Jesus said, okay, but Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. Now, it's just important, and I'll point out why when we get to the next verses. If we get to the next verses. No, we will, I promise. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. Okay. Jesus wants no help from the demons. Even though they know who he is and could tell everyone exactly who he is, he wants none of their help. He wants them to have no part in it, but to be quiet, shut up, and get out of him. And when the demon had thrown the man down in their midst, he came out of the man, having done him no harm. So you see how great Jesus' authority is. He can even protect the man from harm, though the demon has him in his teeth, so to speak. Verse 36, and they were all amazed and said to one another, what is this word? For with authority, there it is again, and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And reports about him went into every place in the surrounding region. Now, this also, this, this text, really this event and this text is presented uh, in this way to us so that we can see that there's an apologetic value to the casting out of the demon, isn't it? Isn't there? I mean, it's one thing to preach with authority and to speak with authority, and the people were amazed at the way Jesus was saying things and the content of what he was saying, both, such that they could only describe it as one having authority, speaking very differently than the scribes or the Pharisees who were saying, well, thus saith the Lord, or uh, well, we think this or we think that, Jesus comes and just simply says, this is, thus saith the Lord. Okay, now, that's easy enough for a charlatan or shyster to do. People do it all the time on Sunday mornings, 
right? If you just decide to sleep in and get church at home on your couch, right? You can listen to, uh, you can look at um, all the televangelists who claim to have this authority and claim to speak under the authority of Christ. Okay, how do we know Jesus isn't just bluffing? How do we know he isn't just bluffing? And the whole point is, he performs this miracle. And Luke is pointing that out to us by linking those two things that Jesus teaches as one who possesses authority. And then as soon as he casts out the demon with the very same word, just with the words from his lips, the people marvel at the authority and power with which he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. So if Jesus were to say, I forgive you your sins, right? Well, there's, there's no way to prove that. How could you demonstrate that? How could you ever know if it was true? Ah, but if there's a demon-possessed man in front of you and everyone, uh, your rabbis and everyone in the synagogue has prayed over him and tried to get rid of the demon and the demon won't be gone and Jesus just comes and says, Sh- you shut up and be gone and he's gone. Well, suddenly that imbues what Jesus is saying with a bit of authority, doesn't it? And that's just the point. Okay, so Luke is highlighting for us that the way that Jesus exercises his power is how? By flexing his muscles. By zapping people with rainbows. Lightning bolts. Raining puppy dogs. Yes, his word. His word. That is the tool and the means of Jesus' power. That's it. That's it. There's no light show. There's no magicianship. There's no, uh, you know, supernatural, super spiritual, super Gnostic nonsense going on. He simply speaks and it is so. Now, this is foundational to understanding the entire work of of Jesus' ministry, not only in his gospel, not only in his quote-unquote earthly life, but in his present life in our midst right? As he exists present with his people to this day, it is his word that possesses the authority and does what it says. Does that make sense? Okay, so so much so that Paul will reflect on this and say, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And Paul will compare the act of belief as God speaking into the darkness, let there be light and there is light. And Christ saying, believe, and there is belief. Where there was nothing but enmity with God, there is now peace with God simply on the account of his speaking. All right, very important. Now that theme continues on in the next section. That's verse 38. And Jesus arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever. And who is Simon? Yes, but who is he really? The first pope. And he has a mother-in-law, which means the first pope was married. Okay, I I hope you understand. Some of you are laughing good. (laughs) Others of you are like, oh my gosh, what is this? Yeah, No, he's not really the first pope. I'm poking fun. Uh, Because if he were, look, he's married. He has a mother-in-law. I mean, no one goes around just adopting (laughs) mother-in-laws. So, Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. Though Peter wasn't so sure, it was kind of nice to have a little break. I'm just joking. That's That's not in your text? Verse 39, and he stood over her and and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Okay, now how does the fever go away? Does Jesus slap her with his his jacket? Does he take off his jacket, whip her with it? No. What's that? With his word. And what's that re-word that we've seen, that we see again? Rebuke. So look at how Jesus is look at how Jesus is operating. Now this is a fascinating point. Okay? An unclean spirit, a sentient being, he rebukes. A fever. Nothing sentient there. What does he do? 
rebukes. You see, Jesus lumps the unclean spirits and all the curse and nastiness and sickness and death and everything that's befallen us, he just lumps it all together. And he simply rebukes it with his word, whether it be an unclean spirit or a fever. He rebukes it. Okay, so once again, we see the power of Jesus' word, the power of his speaking to do the very thing that he says. So the fever leaves her. Now she has a high fever. She's ill. She's probably lying down in bed. Okay, now this is the day where you don't just run to the doctor and get antibiotics. I mean, you've got a high fever. You've probably got an infection. Uh, she's, we don't know how old she is, but she's probably older, especially for that time. This isn't looking good. This isn't looking good. Okay, and then suddenly Jesus comes, he rebukes the fever, and she does what? Yeah, immediately rose and began to serve them. Okay? And so here we see, in a sense, a little miniature resurrection, if you will. We see a little miniature, ex- well, not a, yeah, kind of a miniature exorcism, I mean, it's a microcosm of what God's going to do on the, to the devil and all his host on the last day. And here he is casting out a fever in microcosm, revealing how he is going to eventually cast out all sickness and malady and injury and death. So far, so good? We are just going at light speed, are we not? Okay, verse 40. Wait, I should pause. Any questions? Because we're, we're, uh, we're moving quickly now. Any questions? Any comments? Anything I missed? All right, on we go. Verse 40. Now when the sun was setting, you know, why does Luke bother to tell us that? Here's kind of something exegetes argue about all the time, which I'm not an exegete, so I can kind of scoff from a distance. But the sun was setting. Well, maybe it's just the case that the sun was setting. But why does Luke choose to word it that way or choose to include that? It's fascinating, isn't it? And if you kind of wonder why, uh, there's been all this foreshadowing of the cross and death and resurrection. And we know that when Jesus goes to the cross... There's an unnatural darkness, right? The sun is turned to black. And we know also that uh, as the day grows later, he, he is, he is uh, and he's laid into the tomb, darkness covers, night covers, the sun is set, the Son of God is dead. Okay, so you can choose to read it however you want. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases, brought them to Jesus. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Now, why is laying your hands on them a bad idea? Goodness gracious, communicable diseases. Well, not exactly that. But when one is sick and especially with various kinds of illnesses, undoubtedly those illnesses render them ceremonially unclean. They weren't to touch them. Jesus lays his hands on how many of them? Every one of them, all of them. And Luke is making that point. So again, if he is touching the unclean and making them clean, if he is touching the sick and making them holy, how's he going to do that? And the act of touching them is the act of sharing with them in that which they suffer, right? And so he touches them and heals them, thereby showing that he is one with them in their suffering. And in order to remove their suffering, he will take it upon himself and suffer it ultimately on the cross. Verse 41, and demons also came out of many crying, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them once again, the power of his word, and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. He wanted no help from them. 
nor was he anywhere near trusting them to communicate that he was the Christ and what he had come to do as the Christ. <laughs> okay, so all night long, apparently, that's, uh, that seems to be the way it is. All night long, Jesus was healing. All through the darkness, Jesus was healing. Verse 42, And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, Leave me alone. I need a rest. No, he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God, of the reign of God. That's a better way to understand that. I must preach the good news of the reign of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Okay, now this is, this is a tip, of course, a tip off that Jesus has come to reverse the powers of darkness, to undo the work of the unclean spirits, to undo the work of the cross. By doing that, he's going to take it all upon himself. That's true. But what he has not come to do or be is to be miracle max and to just do stuff to make people feel better for a little while. That's not what he's come to do. He hasn't come to be this, this miracle worker. In fact, all the people that he healed, undoubtedly, they still died. Okay? So the whole point is that Jesus has come to do more than that. And that's the very thing that he says here and why Luke has recorded these words for us where Jesus says, I must preach. Okay, That's the thing. I must preach the reign of the kingdom of God, the reign of God to the other towns as well. I was sent for this purpose. So if you had to pit the two against each other, which you really wouldn't, but if you had to and say, did Jesus come to heal or to preach? Well, it's a no-brainer. I came to preach. And then consider that too, that that then is the heart and the center of Christendom, the heart and the center of what Christ gives us to do. It's why when he calls his pastors, he gives, a, he gives me no command to go out into the world healing everyone. But he does give me the command to preach repentance and forgiveness in his name to all nations. You see, preaching, that's the key. That's the way of eternal life. All right, we'll pause there, and then we'll get to this business about Jesus calling his first disciples. Are there any questions or any comments? Well, I guess I'm up first. Hmm. Back to the sunset. Yeah. Could it be just as simply as uh, since he was in the synagogue that day, mm -hmm. it's now the end of the Sabbath, so mm -hmm. people felt um, unburdened by the law of not doing work, so now they could bring their sick people to Jesus to have him healed. They weren't quite ready to do that on the Sabbath yet. Great point. Great point. But then why would uh, Simon's mother-in-law be serving them if it's the Sabbath still? <laughs> well, you know, that's a great point, Steve, and I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because it foreshadows something that Luke is going to do next and something he's going to spend a lot of time on, and I imagine you know that. And that's that what you find Jesus doing during the Sabbath is the very thing you're not supposed to do during the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do what on the Sabbath? Work. And Jesus is constantly and ever working on the Sabbath, all right? And he's going to scandalize all the, all the folks by doing what he's doing. And there's a, there's a great point to all this, of course. You're right, Stephen. That, that, is, that may very well practically be uh, the, the logical reason, right, and rationale why all the people suddenly come at night. Yeah. Okay, Barry, yes. Back in verse 37, it says, Words about him, Jesus went out into every place in the surrounding area, referencing the healing or the extraction of the demon from the uh, man. Uh, my question is, in some places, Scripture is very specific and says, do not go and tell anyone. Here it says that wasn't done. Can you comment on the why it's different in specific times? I think that's most frequently the case in Mark, that Jesus tells people not to be quiet. I don't know off the top of my head if we'll run into that in Luke. We may well. Um, and, and Jesus has his reasons for that. And, you know, I think, I think in most cases, it's sort of a vocational rationale that he has. He does not, uh, just, just, as he, just as he tells one man that he heals who wants to follow him, he says, no, but go back to your town and, and tell what God has done, right? 
So in some cases, God, uh, Jesus intends for people to serve him in ways that, that they weren't thinking. You know, they were going to serve him in another way. Um, at other times, I think that it's fair to say that Jesus silences those he heals because he recognizes that amongst the people, he is being misunderstood. He's being misunderstood as the guy who's going to overthrow the, the Roman oppressors, feed everybody in Israel, heal everybody in Israel, and, and make this thing work, right? Basically usher in the kingdom of God on earth right now for us and the golden age. And so in healing someone, he says, look, don't go and tell everyone this because they will be perpetuating that false belief. So in some cases, he silence, silences people for that reason. Okay, on we go, chapter 5. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. Okay. So I think if we've got the narrative right, if we're understanding this properly, it's probably the case that the fishermen are all out of their boats. Jesus is getting pressed up against the lake. Instead of getting his feet wet, he jumps into the, one of the boats. He yells for Peter, Simon, to come and get in the boat and push out a little way. Okay. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Now, this is a beautiful thing because this is why a lot of Lutheran churches look the way they do and, and why a lot of churches look the way they do. They often look nautical. In fact, the, the nave is one of the words we have, and it's a, it, it, it's a, it means basically the belly of the ship, and it's where the, it's where the people sit. And now we can, we can think back to the, all sorts of boat imagery because uh, all of it is woven together in our architecture and also in our theology. You can go all the way back, of course, to, to Noah and the ark. Um, and you can even think a bit about Jonah and what happens there. Right, but let's just zoom in on the fact that Jesus' uh, pulpit here is what? A boat. And for that reason, some pulpits will almost have a boat like shape to them. And you'll sometimes see uh, this was a little bit how um, the church was in Garrett, Indiana, where I served as a, as a field worker. It had a, the whole thing had a nautical feel, like an ark turned upside down. And when you stood in the pulpit, it was as if uh, standing in a boat and speaking to the people. And you can, uh, you can reflect on how in, in church art, there are always, well, very often there are boats and fish and nets all around, okay? Well, it all comes from this. So Jesus has made a little impromptu church, and he sat down. Now, once again, that's, a, that's language that indicates he's going to sit down and do formal teaching, all right? And so that's what he's doing. He's doing formal teaching and preaching. He taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. All right, so it's sometime during the day. How's fishing during the day, those of you who fish? Not good. It's when you get the power bait out, right? Yeah, if you fish, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, when it's dawn or dusk, you're fishing with flies or, uh, you know, you're working on your lures and you're, you're, you're trying to imitate the creatures in the, in, in the water or the bugs flying about or the hatch or whatever it is. It's where fishing is, is beautiful and great and glorious. And then it gets to be hot, a little bit miserable, and your sunscreen starts to wear off. And it's time to get out the power bait. And you put your power bait out there and you get your, uh, you get your bobber and you open your Coors and you throw it out there, have a sip of Coors and you just wait. Just wait. Probably the fish aren't going to bite. 
<laughs> so um, obviously this is how they all fished, you know. Uh, they all had their fishing rods. No, clearly not. They were fishing with nets. Now here's the thing. It's the day. They're not going to catch anything. Just like in the heat of the day when we don't catch anything, they're not going to catch anything. And they had been all, out all night. That's when you fish, when it's dark, when it's cool, when the fish are active. And they hadn't caught anything, okay? And so what Jesus asks them to do is something that is just absurd. Not only absurd, but laborious and potentially costly. I mean, you know, you've got to, they're washing the nets. You've got to presumably rewash the nets. You've got, you got to row your way out there. You got to put up the sails. You got to put down the sails. So it's a laborious task and it's ridiculous, and Jesus asks them to do this ludicrous thing. And already then we see the faith of Peter hinted at here, as at your word I will let down the nets. Okay, verse 6, And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. Breaking. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. <laughs> now you got a different problem. It's great. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. All right, now pause. What did he call what did he had he called Jesus before? Master. So it goes from master to Lord. It would go something like from teacher to God. <laughs> that would be the tr change that occurred. Okay, teacher, I'll do what you say. It sounds ridiculous, but you are you, so let's do this. Um, perhaps when we pull up nothing, you'll have some fascinating uh, truth to show us. <laughs> okay? And so many fish come up that the nets are breaking, and the two boats together now are about to sink. And Simon Peter falls down at his knees and basically says, you are God in human flesh. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Now, this is an interesting thing because, not, I mean, it obviously shows a proper attitude that one has in the, in the presence of God. To He immediately falls upon his knees and confesses his sins. And that's what you do when you're in the presence of God. I mean, anyone who says, well, yeah, I was hanging out with God and he was speaking to me. And it's like, what were you doing? Oh, I was just hanging out. I was on my lazy boy, uh, had my feet kicked up and was sipping a Coors, um, had a little power bait on the end of the line. Then, uh, yeah, probably not God. Probably a safe bet you weren't talking with God. Because anyone who comes face to face with God in the scriptures, even God in the human flesh, and realizes it, ends up on their knees, confessing their sins. Okay, now the funny thing is about this, the Lord Jesus just showed them, I mean, they're fishermen, they live by these fish, right? So he just showed them an amazing amount of kindness, graciousness. I mean, he blessed them with, with gifts beyond anything. I mean, with the money that those fish will make, they can easily mend and replace their nets and maybe get some boat, motorboats while they're at it. Who knows? Jesus has blessed them abundantly, all right? And if Peter fully understood, then we could, we could easily see him saying, come near to me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. <laughs> Because he doesn't quite yet understand that the Lord Jesus has come to have abundant mercy upon sinners and to bless us beyond our wildest imaginations and to fill our nets all by this word that he speaks, which to our ears is ludicrous. You see, everything is right here. The whole preaching of the gospel, the whole idea that it strikes our ears is ludicrous and yet works amazing and abundant things. Even faith is all right here. All right, verse 9, for he, Simon, and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken, and so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid, which he has just confessed, I am a sinful man, O Lord. And the Lord says to him, do not be afraid. You see, it's an absolution. I'm a sinful man and I'm in the presence of God. What's going to happen to me? 
I'm going to die. The wages of sin is death. No one looks upon the Lord and lives. And Jesus says, do not be afraid. It's an absolution. In other words, it's your sins are forgiven. Do not be afraid. And from now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Which is a huge amount of wealth in the boats, in the nets, in the fish they had just caught. It doesn't exactly say that they cashed in on that load of fish and then followed him, right? Simply, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now, when Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men, or you from now on you will be catching men, something we can take from this is in the same way that he gave them a great catch by telling them to do the most ridiculous thing you could tell a fisherman to do. So also he makes them fishers of men and he gives them a ridiculous way to accomplish this. It will simply be by the preaching of, your word, of the word. The preaching of the word of God. Right? It won't by, be by strength. It won't be by power. It won't be by money. It won't be by your skill. It won't be by your rhetoric or your good looks. It won't be by any of that. It will simply be by my word. And it will bring in an absolutely bizarre and wonderful net full of men. And he's got a parable to this, uh, to this respect as well, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. We'll let his parable speak then about the net that is his gospel and the kind of fish that it drags in. All right. So then we have Jesus preaching over the waters, and we have the first preachers under him called. Pretty foundational text for the whole life of the church. Any uh, thoughts, any questions? All right, very good. We're doing well. We've got two and a half minutes. At, our, at this breakneck speed, we may as well do the next one. Okay. Verse 12, while he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. Okay. Not just leprous, not just a little bit, full of leprosy. Beyond help, beyond hope. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Here is a guy who gets it, right? Not only does he call him Lord in the context where we just saw Simon call Jesus Lord, but he says, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and held it back a little ways because it's gross. No, and touched him, this man full of leprosy. Again, think about that. what that means. It goes from being Jesus being clean to being unclean, touching that man. Okay. And he says, I will, or I will it to be so, be clean. So by touching and by speaking. And immediately the leprosy left the man. And he charged him to tell no one. Here we go, Barry. Charged him to... Tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest. Now, that's according to Old Testament law. And make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for a proof to them. In fact, when you thought you were getting leprosy of any kind, or you just got some weird sore, you don't go to your general practitioner. You go to the priest, and he says, yeah, that's a weird sore. And he tells you, uh, okay, this is, how, this, is, this is how long you're unclean for, and you need to come and see me again. And um, So he's the one that diagnoses your, your state of uncleanness, okay? So when Jesus says, go and show yourself to the priest, not only is Jesus saying, be obedient to the law, right? But one of the fascinating things about Jesus taking this, this track is he is going to have this verified by the equivalent of a doctor. I mean, this would be like if Benny Hinn said, okay, I have healed you. Now there's a doctor right over there. Go and make sure that the doctor says that you are healed, right? And then report it all around, all right? In other words, there is, again, an, an apologetic sense, a sense in which Jesus is defending who he is and what he's doing, and he's willing to subject that to scrutiny, even the scrutiny of the priest, Okay. And look what Jesus specifically says at the end of 14, for a proof to them. You see, the priest would have known this man, would have diagnosed this man, and now he comes and suddenly he is clean, this man who is full of leprosy, this man who is beyond help or hope. And now he comes and he says, look, I am utterly clean. 
And the priest says, how did this happen? And the leper says, Jesus. It's a proof for them, a proof to them, not just this one priest, but all of them. You see, Jesus is willing to back up his talk and his actions with proof and verification. Okay, thus 15, but now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to a to desolate places and pray. And so now we know back in chapter 442, when he goes off and goes to a desolate place, he's there to pray. And you see how Jesus here retreats to pray, to be strengthened by his Father, no doubt. And I think that's sufficient for today. The Lord be with you.